And welcome, everybody, to your Friday Nooner with me, Dave Lamont. Thank you very much for joining me. My guest, Steve Hawkins, will be with you in just a mere matter of seconds. And I'm really happy to have Hawk on the program today for a wide variety of reasons. But I thought I'd start out on this Tuesday, or should be Friday at noon, to give you uh, a quick Masters update. For those of you who thought that this was going to be a wire-to-wire -wire runaway win for Justin Rose after yesterday, uh, no. Uh, three over through eight holes. He's down to four under. His lead has shrunk to one. So, so much for that plot line. And naturally, he falls back to the field, which brings in all the guys who didn't play well yesterday back in. Of course, they may have problems too today. So, as always, uh, it's a fascinating uh, few days in Augusta. And one of these days, I'll get lucky in that ticket lottery. Unless I'm well-connected like my guest. Who knows how many times this man has been. He knows everybody. But I want to give him the, a proper introduction. Um, former head coach, of course, at Quincy, we can't forget about that, at Western Michigan, where he had tremendous success, winning two MAC championships, two in the regular season, eight division titles, 291 games, and over 400 wins in his career, counting his days at Quincy. And after leaving Western Michigan, he has gone on to work for ESPN as a game analyst and is now the host of the very successful Next Possession podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Hawk, Steve Hawkins, how are you? I'm doing well, Dave. How about yourself? I appreciate you having me. And thanks, well, I'm, uh, yeah, thanks for the Masters update. I'm, I'm not up to speed. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking time. I know this is kind of a family week for you, and I know how important that is, especially since you have more time uh, that you're out of coaching for the moment to spend with Kelly and your kids. So I'm very, very grateful that you, uh, you have a little bit of time. I want to talk to you about something so incredibly important. I can't wait. Can the Dodgers repeat? Uh, let's hope so. I, I still get, I, I mean, that is, you're right. I mean, that is incredibly important uh, right now. Uh, now that college basketball is over, um, Dave, obviously, you know how, how I feel about my Dodgers. I'm, I'm not, it's not natural um, to, to, to uh, follow, to follow a team like I follow them. So I'm, I'm, I still see some holes uh, in the, uh, in the roster. So that I'm a little nervous about, but, but I'll be watching. Yeah, I, I think the first time we ever talked, and just to bring people up to speed uh, who may not know the story, that my oldest son, Drake, played for Hawk at Western Michigan for four years. And uh, so obviously there's recruiting and there's conversations going on. And I, I think it's the first time we ever spoke on the phone. I was actually driving to a Marlins Mets game. <laughs> and when you heard that, I think we did spend more time talking about baseball than we might have about the advantages of Western Michigan and playing college basketball for you. Because that's when I found out what a crazy Dodger fan you are. Yeah. It's uh if we start talking baseball, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm probably talking about the wrong sport. It, it, <laughs> talking about basketball. Uh, I love talking baseball. I, I, I just love the game and specifically the Dodgers growing up with Ben Scully. Uh, you know, he was my sound of summer, you know, every single year and, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's not natural. I, 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 a quick story here. Dan Dockett's obviously an ESPN mm -hmm. guy. Um, we had a conversation. He's a massive Cubs fan. And so he was coaching at Bowling Green at the time. And uh, we got into this discussion about uh, who a bigger fan of their team was. Whether <laughs> he was a Cubs fan or I was a bigger Dodgers fan. And he, he had told me the story about uh, some things about he did for the Cubs. And he said, now, what do you got? And I said, well, you know, every game I watch at home, uh, you know, I've got my Dodgers hat on. And he goes, well, that's nothing. And I said, yeah, but when they come up to bat, I take my hat off and I put my helmet on. Oh, <laughs> and he goes, okay, uh, you got my respect now. You probably so, have the pine tar streaks on the bill of the cap and, uh, you know, but that was, I, I grew up back in a day where the pine tar, you know, this was pre George Brett, you know, so it, it was, it was, uh, it was just a straight, it was just a straight blue helmet. Yes. Yeah. Classic look. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's talk a little bit here because you, you yeah. were at Western Michigan for a long time, first as an assistant, and then you became the head coach. It's always been said, and I hear other coaches say this it's very difficult to maintain your consistency and get everybody to keep listening to your message year in and year out. Scott Drew, 16 years at Baylor, highly successful, and he walked into maybe the worst situation in the history of the sport. How has he been able to maintain that message 
and be such a consistent winner and now finally bring home the title? Well, I, I think culture, you know, it's a word that is loosely thrown around. And your son, Drake, uh, is, is probably at, with, when it comes to Chris Beard, I realize, you know, they're down in the same neck of the woods now. But um, I, I think that when I had a chance to visit with Chris Beard going a few years back and uh, when he was at Texas Tech and uh, I was there with him for a couple of days in the summer and the culture, it, it just it it was so palpable um, when you walked in. And uh, I, you know, we talked about family atmosphere a lot and I think we had it uh, uh, for sure at Western. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's a difference between culture and chemistry. Okay, and I think that sustainability, uh, the key to sustainability has to do with culture, not chemistry. Chemistry is temporary. Chemistry is something where it just it sort of happens. You know, you get the right group of guys together at the right time. They got great chemistry. Um, but when you have culture, uh, then it is passed down from, uh, from class to class. You know, here's the way we do things at Baylor, or here's the way we do things at Texas or at Western Michigan. And uh, the one thing that they have been, when you look at, uh, I think the kid's name was Vital, um, you know, that had been in the program at, at Baylor for, I don't know, five years now, something like that. You know, this means everything to him. So he could, he could talk to the younger guys. They have a lot of players. They had a lot of players at Baylor that had been in that program for more than just a year or two. And sustainability, uh, sweat equity and sustainability, uh, I think they have a lot in common. Beard moving to Texas, uh, surprising, or do you think it was the right time for him to leave Texas Tech? Well, I don't, I, I mean, if, it, if it's any other situation, I think that everybody understands it, uh, you know, because this is where he graduated. He, this is his alma mater, you know, and I, I don't think anybody would ever fault anybody for going back uh, to their alma mater. Now, the fact that it was Texas Tech, you know, when he's moving in state, in conference, things like that, you know, that may raise some eyebrows. Um, but if he had been coming from Oklahoma uh, to Texas, I, you know, I, even though that's a huge, you know, that's a huge rivalry in and of itself. But if he had been coming from, uh, you know, any other school in the Big 12, I don't think anybody would have batted an eye. Um, you have a chance to go to your alma mater, and especially with the resources that they have uh, at Texas, not that not that uh, Texas Tech doesn't have them. No, they, they uh, have them. They have them. And it was tremendous. But, you know, then you're going, and I don't mean any disrespect to the city of Lubbock, um, but there's a little bit of difference between in, in location, uh, mm -hmm. Texas and Austin, uh, where they're located, everything they have around. Austin's a tremendous city yes. to recruit to, uh, as well as a great school to go to. Uh, and then uh, the resources are still unbelievable. That said, uh, there was a reason for the coaching change. There were all sorts of rumors that Shaka Smart sort of uh, got out before they got him when he went to Marquette. I have no idea if that's true or not. And they haven't quite broken through. Rick Barnes obviously had some success, but he also had Kevin Durant, for heaven's sakes, uh, one of the most natural players in the history of the game. I've always been fascinated, Steve, by certain schools that seemingly have the name value but don't quite crack through. We're finally seeing USC crack yeah. through. Uh, UCLA is coming back, but they have a great coach in Mick Cronin. What is it about that, that it, at Texas in particular, that, that they can't quite break through and, and have those big victories in the tournament? You know, it's really interesting. It, 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 I'm fascinated by it as well, uh, you know, because when you talk about Texas basketball, everybody, Texas anything, uh, everybody talk, but everybody thinks they should win. They have everything they need um, to win. Um, but I had an AAU coach uh, down in the Dallas area tell me one time, not all that long ago, about two or three years ago, uh, he said that, um, he said, you know, Texas Tech right now is the only basketball school in the state of Texas. He said, you know, almost every, every other school he would consider to be a football school, uh, including obviously Texas. And, and so, uh, um, you know, there mm -hmm. might have been some truth to that. Uh, Texas basketball has not traditionally drawn well. They have the resources, but they haven't drawn necessarily very well. Um, you're right, Rick Barnes, uh, you know, he had, but they kind of ran him out too. And yeah, you know, they did. Uh, same situation. And you see Rick Barnes, what he's doing at Tennessee now. It's not like the guy forgot to coach. 
um, <laughs> or, or that he was a bad coach. He just got on. He just got into a situation now at Tennessee where it's a little bit better fit. We'll see what Shaka can do now at Marquette, uh, up in an area where he's from. Um, but that, I, if there's anybody that can get it going, it, it is Chris. He brings a lot of excitement anywhere he goes. He's a very outside the box thinker. Um, he can relate really, really well to the kids of today. He he recruits well to the kids of today. He uses Instagram. He uses uh, uh, all the social media. Um, he'll use rap. Uh, you know, he'll use videos. He connects with the students, the community. I, I think I think this is a, a perfect marriage. He's put together an unbelievable staff. I couldn't believe what I talked to Drake the other day. He was telling me who they they got two guys who left head coaching jobs in Texas and they got someone out of Kansas to help them recruit. I could not believe that. Yeah, and and again, I think it goes to the resource. I have no idea how much money they're making, but they probably uh, are making whatever it is they wanted to make <laughs> in, in order to get them to move. You know, and so uh, it's an unbelievable staff that they've put together. And it's just, I think that they, I, I look for a pretty quick turnaround uh, mm -hmm. uh, there at Texas. Not, they had a great year. Um, they just got, I, I think that they had gone to a sweet 16 or something like that. If they didn't get upset by Abilene Christian in the first round, we might've been talking about a little bit different story. Um, but given uh, that early exit, um, I think that's something that uh, certainly precipitated this. If I had, had a chance to talk to you in, say, September of 2020. And I told you, hey, Hawk, don't worry, man. We're going to crown a champion. We're going to have a tournament. We're going to have conference tournaments. We're going to get through all of this with some interruptions. But we'll have a champ. Would you have believed me? I would. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you why. The NCAA, it's money. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that, that, I mean, everybody talks about that like it's a bad thing. You know, it, it, you need it. Uh, yeah. You know, we all need it, you know, and and so, uh, you know, when we start talking about the multi-million dollar business that is the NCAA and what it brings to people, I, it, it costs money. And the NCAA tournament by far is the biggest money maker. Okay? And, and when they when it does not get played, uh, it does not get the television money that is that is uh that would be owed to it um, because they they aren't fulfilling their contract um you, you got to remember i mean dave you you know you work at, at espn you did uh, you do you are heavily involved in the media on um, part of things uh, the the ncaa tournament they came out with an announcement that uh they were going to be playing the tournament in indianapolis uh, they came out with that announcement before teams had even figured out in conferences how they yeah. could, how they were going to play things. That's right. You know, there were a lot of conferences that hadn't figured out what was going to go on yet. But the NCAA, they got that right in a hurry. They knew the importance because th these schools count on this money. And especially when you look at the non-power uh, five schools, they really rely heavily on this money to help support not just their own basketball program and football program, but you go all the way down the line to the uh, what's called the Olympic sports. I mean, women's soccer needs this money, you know. That, so I, I, I figured if they were going to do anything, they were going to figure out a way to play the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and I, you know what? Other than the VCU problem, and I, and I'm every person who's got a heart feels terribly for them. And I had uh, you might know Mark Adams and Mark Wise. I had them on. They're buddies of mine, and I asked them early in the tournament, "Does that overshadow the first weekend of the tournament, or does the playing?" take precedence in your mind and they both said no it, it's a it's a blip but it's not anything that's going to ruin the tournament and, I, and ultimately i don't think it did no i i would agree you know i think that it's a situation where i think it put a scare in all of us because if you remember also right about the same time we mm -hmm. had the referees uh that were that were uh, taken out of the tournament so early on before the tournament ever began we had a team that that had to withdraw and then we also had six referees, good referees, um, that were taken out of the tournament. Um, one tested positive, the others uh, with contact tracing. And, and so early on, but I, I'll tell you, you, there's no way. I, I think March Madness delivered in every way that we had hoped it would. You know, in the way I look at it, Dave, 
is, you know, I do my own podcast and I just did this coming week's episode. I just recorded it last night. And one of the things that I said, uh, and it just sort of occurred to me as I was talking about it, is that I didn't hear anybody complain about the tournament. You know, everybody mm -hmm. was back to just worrying about um, winning and losing. You know, the fans were caught up in their own teams, winning, losing. Uh, there was very, in, in that is normal. You know, that is a form of normalcy that I think we sorely needed. Well, I went to Las Vegas again this year, which I normally do. I obviously could not do it last year. And I would say it wasn't quite like it can, like it is normally, but it was great to be there. I, I ended up, it felt more significant uh, because everybody missed that opportunity. And, and you heard the same yells and the same roars and, you know, the noise that you get used to. So next year, assuming that we can do a full-blown season with no interruptions and no delays and any of that other stuff, uh, it should be back to normal. But I would like to make note for my, my listeners and viewers here that at the 1440 mark, Steve said something nice about basketball officials. Um, <laughs> I'm going to write that down. I might, you know, because uh, I might have seen you in a game or two. Uh, and this leads me to a question, a serious question. Though. I kid with you a little bit. Over the years, you developed a style of how to coach, how to prepare your team, all this. How did you develop your style of how to deal with officials? Or you know, Did you wing it? Did you have a strategy? How, how do coaches do that? It's a really great question. Um, so the assigner of officials, the national, he's not the assigner, he's the national coordinator of officials, is a guy named J.D. Collins. Okay, and J.D., when I was working, you mentioned Quincy. Uh, it's a Division II league in Illinois. When I was coaching at Quincy, J.D. was a referee in that Division II league. He and I sort of came up together, you know, and we've known each other forever. He was actually a, uh, a guest on my podcast uh, that I had earlier. And, and when you first get into any conference, you know, when I first uh, took over as head coach at Western Michigan in 2004, some of the referees – uh, at that time, I had known from my days at Quincy. Okay. Uh, and then you know, the ones that I didn't know were already uh, Division One referees that had been there for a long time. And, uh, you know, over the, we won uh, the NCAA, or excuse me, we won the MAC tournament in 2004, my first year as a head coach. I think that helped uh, with some credibility because I didn't have a lot to moan and groan about. You know, so they were okay with me in 2004 because we were winning. Um, and so because we were winning, I wasn't complaining a lot. So we got off on a good foot. And then the other part of things is through the years, um, you just sort of, they get used to you and you get used to them. Um, they get used to you knowing that, okay, this guy is going to be like, he's, he's wound tight, you know, in yeah. games, every single play matters to him. He's going to coach his team. He's going to get on the refs. He's going to do a little bit of everything. And and uh, uh, and they just sort of I don't want to say they give you a longer leash. It's just you know, it's just like a, a post player. You know, well, they, they scout too in a way. They they, they sort of share with, scouting too. Yeah, yeah, without question. I mean, you take your son Drake. Drake was a really physical player, you know, and so they knew coming into a game, uh, especially especially after Drake's freshman year, they knew that the big fella was a physical player. And, uh, and, and, you know, they might get them for an early one. Um, but generally speaking, they're going to tell Drake Lamont, you know, his sophomore, junior, and certainly a senior year, a hey, Drake, and they'll call him by his first name. Right. You know, they'll say, Drake, hey, it, it, clean it up in here a little bit. And, and so and that's really kind of the way it goes. Uh, and, and I think that you end up, you end up getting a rapport. And then there's certain referees. Bo Borowski was in the national championship game. Uh, he called the NCAA championship game the other night and Bo and I go a long way back and he, he and I have had some knockdown drag outs, you know, in my last year, my last year at Western, we were playing <laughs> and it, I was not happy with another official uh, on, on the court. And so I'm, I'm screaming across the court at him and Bo comes over. He's like, Hawk, don't make me come over and ding you. I'm like, what's this got to do with you? I'm, I'm complaining about the other guy. You know, when I got a complaint with you, I'll let you know. And he's like, Hawk, we're a team out here. And I'm like, yeah, but you cover for him, you know, right now. And so we can kind of go, <laughs> we can kind of go back and forth and, and have some fun with it. 
Um, and then the other part of things, Dave, it's just like anybody else. Uh, you know, you got to kind of forget. Um, it's hard sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. but you got to you got to kind of forget what happens from game to game. Have a short memory, you know, and then go into the next game the very best you can. I'm not saying I did it all the time, but the very best you can. Well, I hadn't planned on talking to you about officials, but you made me think about it. Then I have to tell you something that you didn't know. Okay. Um, you were thrown out of a game by a guy I went to high school with. Who now? That, that is this in Quincy or no? This was at Western. That's the only reason I would have known. Tony Green. That's the only game I got thrown out of. Tony you know, did it with him. I went to high. He was a point guard at Fort Lauderdale High, and we're still friends. And I was traveling. You, I think you guys were maybe Myrtle Beach. Is that uh, possible? Yeah, it was. It was Myrtle. All right. I was in Austin, oddly enough, and I was flying home, and I said, crap, you know what? I'm going to completely miss the game. I can't even follow it online. You know, I'm just I, there's nothing I can do. And I somehow, I don't know where I saw it, I saw the list of officials online, and Tony was one of them. I said, well, isn't that cool? I think he had officiated another game, and he knows that Drake's my son and all that. So I said, well, that is really neat. You know, it's kind of a, wow, you know, you're getting old, but it's okay. I land. I get a phone call. It's Tony. And he goes, and I know it's him. I go, hey. He goes, I had to bounce your coach. <laughs> I want to know the reason. I want to know the reason to this day. I, I know – he repeated some of what you said, and I I don't remember if oh, he explained I, what happened. I mean, obviously you got into him about something, and I don't know did he did he do like a one and then wait or was it quick? No, this was really quick. It's the okay. only game in seventeen years. Oh my god! That I got thrown out of the only game, and that's hysterical. And when you're playing, I don't remember who we were playing. We, oh, we were playing uh, Boise State. Uh, that's it. Yep. And so, um, yeah, we, it, it, you know, it's kind of quiet. Um, I complained about a call uh, early on, nothing major, just mm-hmm. like, oh, come on now. You know, that wasn't this or whatever it may have been. And he gave me that that's enough. And I went, whoa, that was quick. And, and, uh, and so it went on a little bit more. The I'm talking about the game, not me. Yeah, the yeah. Game. It went on a little bit more. And, um, then I said something else. It's like, ah, Tony, come on now. You know, that, that, that's it. And he goes, coach, I told you that's enough. Well, we went into the huddle. Oh, shortly after that. And I was upset at the team. And I took the clipboard in my hand and I said, and I was mad at them. And I dropped the clipboard loud. And then I got up and I looked at Tony and he must have thought that it was at him. And he gave me the next one and said, you're out of here. Well, then I got my money's worth. Right. That's what I, that's what he told me. He said, after you, after he did it, that you had a few things. And, you know, I think he knows that's part of it. And the Lord knows, you know, it's part of it. But I just thought I'd bring that up because I didn't know that you had, no one else had ever gotten you. Because I remember the, the, the counting the minutes until you would take off your sports jacket uh, and all the, you know, the stuff that was actually part of the Hawk show. I think they, you know, I, I enjoyed that stuff and I know the fans did too, but I didn't know that. Yeah, it, as a matter of fact, Leon Rice, the head coach at Boise State, I went over to shake his hand, and he's like, that was ridiculous. And then I walked off the court, and I thought, well, you know, was I out of line or not? And I walked, and Tim Floyd at the time, yeah. head, coach, head coach at UTEP, they were getting ready to play. And he goes, what got into that guy? <laughs> 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 these are Oh, veteran, man. These are veteran coaches, you know, that are telling me, Hawk, I, you didn't deserve it. And I'm like, hi. In 17 years that, you know, this hadn't got, so um, I don't, I, you know what, I'm going to, because you went to high school with them, I'm going to give Fort Lauderdale High a push. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I usually see him once or twice a year at a game and, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I just thought it was hilarious that when I got home, you know, Drake didn't call. Nobody called. I think my wife might have been out there with my in-laws watching the tournament. <laughs> it was him. <laughs> now, I would say a lot more, but I hope to get into coaching again next year. I hope to be back on the court. So, uh, you know, when I'm done officially, right. I'll give you, I will give you the on-air version of, of or, or my retired version of what actually took place. <laughs> 
I, you know what? I will look forward to that. Uh, I, I didn't want to drop the NCAA tournament, but we ended up going down that road. I wanted to ask you about Gonzaga. Um, how do you view their season going all that way and then not being able to finish as they were capable of? I, I still think it's a huge success. Um, you know, it's, it's, I understand if anybody is disappointed. Um, I think that the, I think that the, uh, the talk about the, the West coast conference, not preparing them. I think that's hogwash. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't think the only thing that I think at times, uh, when you have a school like Gonzaga at times that may help them, uh, is the fact that it may not be as physical. Uh, and so that uh, night in night out so that you may be able to stay away from injuries, not losses, um, yeah. but injuries. Okay. That could impact your, that can impact what you do at the end of a year. Um, but I, I, I mean, I view their season as a great success. Um, I, you know, if anything, I am a believer that that UCLA game might've taken something out of them, but I don't know if they could have beat Baylor on Monday night, the way yeah. Baylor looked, the way they played, um, those guards that Baylor have, uh, you know, they had three guards out there that can do an awful lot, you know, off the bounce, they can create, uh, obviously they were the best three point shooting team you know, in, in the nation this year. And when you, it, it, what you got to hope for is that they're off, you know, yeah, they and were not. they were not off and they were so disruptive to Gonzaga's offense. Gonzaga has a pattern oriented offense. Um, and they had a really difficult time getting into any of their patterns. Uh, I, I it, it, they just disrupted everything that they wanted to do. They set the tone early. You know, I think Gonzaga, you could see the guys telling each other, it's okay, we're okay, we're okay. But when I looked at them, I I, I, I did not see it in their eyes like we're okay. You know, yeah. I, I thought that they looked around like these guys are playing out here on roller skates, you know, and, and we're playing in quicksand. It was just a different level of athleticism and a different level of play. That was a dominating performance. You mentioned you can see it in the eyes. I'm sure you could tell when your teams were reeling a little bit. I know there are various ways. Did you try to figure out on the fly what's the best way to get to these guys to bring them back in? Yeah, there's no question. I, I, I've always, you know, Dave, I always like it. took me a while to figure it out. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I loved my time at Quincy, because there were mistakes that I made or there were lessons learned at the division two level, certainly at a time when there was no social media that, you yeah. know, and, and uh, so if I had been a division one coach with social media and made some of those mistakes, uh, I would have been ripped to shreds. Um, but I made some of those mistakes early and learned some lessons. And one of the big ones is as a coach is you have to change up your message. Okay. You, know, you have to change it. Otherwise it's like going to church on Sunday and listening to a, a minister, a preacher, whatever it is you do, that's just speaking monotone. Mm -hmm. You know, the next thing you know, you're starting to think about your grocery list. <laughs> you know, but if he's if, if 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 he or she is changing their inflection, you know, just the way you would do as an announcer. Yes, it keeps your attention. And so there were times that even if we had been in the middle of a four-game winning streak, I might come in and just be pissed off. Um, because I knew that it, it would get their attention back, you know, and, and so I, I, I would have to change and, and try and keep things fresh. And so, yeah, that definitely comes into play uh, from time to time as well. You're a Southern California man, and you had the fortune of being around the great John Wooden. And we, you know, I think a lot of people may know that. Maybe they don't. Maybe you were the original driving Miss Daisy, only in this case you were driving around uh, the winningest college basketball coach at the time and perhaps the greatest college basketball coach of all time. Uh, is it any coincidence that that time you spent in his camps and driving him around and all of a sudden you're a basketball coach? Uh, no. Um, I was actually a football player coming up. And, <laughs> and so, um, but I loved basketball, but I was vertically challenged. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and, and I, so was my son, as you found out, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not right, but just, he, he and I had the same, you know, 
we had a hard time jumping over a Kalamazoo phone book, you know, and so, uh, That's all right. you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I always love the game though. And so when I started working, uh, coach Wooden's camps, um, there, it was also at a point in time with me, I grew up in a tough neighborhood, um, in Southern California. And, uh, it was also at a point in time where I kind of, there were some things going on around me, uh, that I could have easily gone down a wrong path. And I got around Coach Wooden, and I have a great dad. He's 93 years old, but Coach Wooden was almost a second dad um, mm -hmm. to me in many ways, uh, and in terms of a role model and the direction I wanted my life to go. I wanted to coach. I wanted to teach. Uh, he was the guy that I needed to really step in at that point in time. Yeah, it's interesting. I would always wonder if you brought the exact same man into coaching today how it would work for him with all of the things that he never had dealt with. Uh, and same thing with Vince Lombardi, you know, although he was an executive at the same time he was a coach, I, I wonder, could they, could those principles succeed? Could those philosophies still succeed today? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you know, coach wouldn't. So again, your viewers and listeners un understand uh, part of my job was working as camps. I worked as camps every summer. And so there were anywhere between five and six camps, uh, five days a week, uh, every summer. And the perk of my job, I, I helped, I was the assistant director basically of the camp. And, but the real perk of it was I picked them up every morning and took them home every afternoon. Now in the mornings, we were alone a lot in the van because it was really early in the morning. The, but uh, in the afternoon, when I took them home, we were almost never alone. Uh, because that was the time that he would do. There was always somebody wanting a piece of Coach Wooden, whether it be a media member, a coach, it could be a friend. But that half hour to 40 minute drive from Thousand Oaks to Encino was a time that he used to conduct interviews or visit. So I got to listen to all of those through the better part of a decade. Uh, and that, that's a lot of days. That's 30 days out of the summer, uh, you know, 25, 30 days out of the summer. And you know, the better part of an hour and a half for wow. the better part of a decade. It, it was, you know, you talk about driving Miss Daisy. It was almost like sitting at the feet of Yoda, you know, basketball <laughs> Yoda with the wisdom that, that he had. And uh, he, he actually came back to Kalamazoo and, and did a fundraiser for us. He became a very, very good friend, uh, not just my mentor uh, uh, for me. So anyway, um, one of the questions that I heard asked repeatedly, as you can imagine, there were a lot of the same questions asked, but one of the questions was, was similar to what you just brought up. And that is coach, do you think you could still coach today's kids? And I, I always knew, I remember one particular day we were driving and this guy had asked the question, you know, coach, and he kind of led him in the direction he wanted him to go. He said, coach, do you think you could coach today's kids? You know, I mean, they, they wear their, they wear their shorts down around the rear ends you know, they, they got tattoos and dreadlocks. And, and I and I knew in my head, because I've heard this question answered before, this guy thinks he's going to get the right answer, but he's getting ready to get lit up. And Coach Wooden and let him finish. And then he said, of course I could. He said, young man, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think it was easy coaching during the Vietnam War? You know, do you think it was easy coaching during the Civil Rights Movement? He said, it wasn't. Young man, let me ask you a question. Did you wear bell bottoms when you were in college? Did you have mutton chops? Did you have long hair? Did maybe did you maybe experiment with marijuana? You know, and the guy kind of had a sheepish grin. And he said, of course you did. He said, and that's what that's why they call it a college age, a transitional phase. It's a transitional phase for a reason. OK, you've got young people, especially basketball players that are simultaneously trying to project confidence because they're an athlete. And at the same time, they're trying to find themselves uh, as an individual. And, and so Coach Wooden had a great understanding of that, had great uh, personal relationships with his players, but yet was able to coach the game and actually know the game at, at a very high level. And then that allowed, and then he's coaching at UCLA, one of the most beautiful campuses, uh, you know, in the nation. And so mm -hmm. it was a, a, and at a time when there were no scholarship limits. So, you, you know, you got to remember when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Louis Alcindor at that time, uh, this was freshman ineligible at a time when the were, freshmen were ineligible. I know. His, his freshman team beat the varsity team 
that year and the varsity team won the national championship you know and so they had so many players during the time but yeah i i, I really think that coach it didn't matter who it was when it was i really believe coach kids respond to passion mm -hmm. you know coach had a lot of passion kids respond to lines that are black and white even though they will try and make them gray um i think kids respond to that and and once they know what they can and can't do and that their coach loves them and coach wouldn't love his players i i think they'll do anything they want for you it, mick yeah. cronin you brought up mick cronin a minute yes ago. and i had him on a previous episode of my podcast and mick cronin said something that really stuck with me he said hawk you, you got to love them hard to coach them hard you know and i think there's a lot of truth to that you know you see some coaches struggle today with coaching kids hard and kids transferring but when they know that you love them you you can you can really get on these guys hard and really coach them hard well it's worked although he struggled lately he worked for frank martin yeah uh, perfect example i have sat through frank martin practices and i've known frank because he's from down here in south florida so i know what's coming so it's a little bit amusing to me actually but at the same time, he would get the best effort out of his players. And I would, if I, if you brought in members of the public who didn't really understand, they would just, what is this? Exactly. But, and, and then there's other guys like Lon Kruger, scholarly approach uh, before he finally retired. Not a guy, you know, that's just not the way he does it. Everybody has their personality. I think if you're honest, yeah, that's huge. And if people know, okay, well, that's Lon Kruger. Um, and that's Steve Hawkins. That's Mick Cronin. That's who, you know, uh, that's what I think. I think honesty and sincerity, you know, players can smell BS. There it is right there. Uh, I, I think if you're trying to be somebody else where young coaches get in trouble is when they move on and they try and be whoever they came from their boss. Now you can take certain things, it may be an offense or a defense or certain concepts uh, or culture, um, that kind of thing, but you can't try and be them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think when you look back at, um, some of Bobby Knight's, you know, if you want to go back, some of Bobby Knight's coaches that went on, um, they struggled with that. Uh, you know, there were guys that really wanted and, and tried to coach a lot like coach Knight, And, and that's, there's only one of him, you know, um, you bring up tough coaches. I'm not talking about assistant coaches now. But, but I've been to some of Tom Izzo's practices at Michigan State. He's been to ours. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, you want to talk about, you know, and, and people will criticize coaches. And they'll say things like, well, the game has passed him up. It hasn't passed him up. Uh, you know, these kids love him. And he loves them. And that, you know, you saw like Magic Johnson's tweet, you know, during the, during the game, the typical MSU exchange. I think that was Raymond Green, actually. You know, that's a typical MSU. Type. Oh, yeah, when he got on the player. It's funny yeah. because, and again, I'm in a unique position being the, the dad to athletes. I've seen coaches get on my kids, and I know it's not personal. They screwed up. Or the coach saw something that maybe an average spectator wouldn't see, but you see, and you'd get, okay, that's just part of the deal. And people get, well, why do you let him play? I, I, you know, I. It, that's just coaching. I mean, as long as there's a message there and a, an opportunity for you to, to make that a, him a better player, then, you know, whatever you deliver is fine by me. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a big, yeah, I saw that. I went, yeah, so that very much, that exchange could have just as easily happened in the locker room away from the camera. It, it's, it's, you know, I think there is a, a, a little bit of a misunderstanding among people who aren't in the game that uh, you have to be nice all the time and that's just not going to work. Yeah, I mean, there's, you're right, uh, you know, and I, I don't think that, I, and, you know, the other part of day, uh, of things here, Dave, is um, I think players sign up for something, you know, and, it, and that's where the honesty begins. You, you know, I remember getting the commitment uh, uh, from Drake when I was down there uh, in Miami, and, and I had Coach Farmer, Coach Bates with me, and, and, yeah. uh, and Drake committed to us, you were there. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, afterwards we were so blasted happy about it. Um, we went and celebrated, not you, cause we weren't allowed to do that, but we went and celebrated at Cheesecake Factory. We weren't allowed. I know. <laughs> but it was, it, it, you know, but he knew what he was signing up for, you know, and, um, he exactly. knew that there was going to be intensity 
Uh, he knew that we were going to be dead honest with him. It, it's when it's when the message changes. It's like, well, wait a minute, who is this guy? You know that that recruited me. This is not, you know, this is not what I signed up for. That's when some issues start to occur. Um, you know, and then the transfer portal starts to fill up. Now it's filling up for a different reason. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that the Michigan State kids, they understand exactly what they're signing up for. I think that the South Carolina kids and, and now the UCLA kids, uh, you know, Mick Cronin, uh, I, I think they know exact Bob Huggins, you know, mm -hmm. another that it's part of that family. Yeah. Uh, you know, Brad Underwood at Illinois, they're all part of the Huggy Bear family. You know, and and uh, they know what they're signing up for. They know they're going to get jumped, and they know that they can be honest with the coach back. Uh, you know, that goes both ways. They'll come back at their coach. You know, it's not just a yes sir thing. They will come right back at their coach uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that I think the honesty part is, is the most important thing. Well, you mentioned you're interested in getting back into coaching. In the meantime, you do have a podcast called Next Possession. It's terrific. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about that, if you would, please. Well, it's a lot of fun and more than it is anything else. I, I haven't made a, a single penny. As a matter of fact, it's cost me some money. My wife likes to remind me of that. Um, but it is a, uh, you know, when I got let go, it was in the middle of the pandemic. It was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. you know, and so I did not have a chance to get back into coaching because hiring freezes were put in place everywhere. Yeah, you know, And so... Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was much more fortunate than so many people that lost so many things, lives included, um, during this. We were fortunate. We had saved for a rainy day. But I was talking with one of my former players, a guy named Joe Wrights, who, again, I yeah. remember. Um, and Joe was, uh, he played for me. And then he went on to have a great NFL career. And Joe put me in touch with, uh, for lack of a better term, I call her a life coach. Um, her name is Jen Welfong, and she helps some other NFL players transition in their lives from the NFL to to uh, what they're going to what they're going to do with next possession. And Drake heard that term a lot. You know, I always preach next possession and uh, you, we all got to get to the next possession, you know, in life, in basketball, whatever it may be. So out of the blue, one day we had been talking, Jen and I had been talking. She was down in your neck of the woods in Florida taking a walk. She said, Hawk, wait a minute. I'm taking a walk right now. And I just got it. Uh, podcast. You need to do a podcast. And a really long story to make it very short. That was the fourth person in a three-day period that said you should do a podcast. So it was one of those things where it's like, okay, well, maybe say, I had no idea what it was. <laughs> um, I never listened to it. And then trying to put together a podcast. I like the idea of it. Trying to put together one when uh, this would have been a lot easier. Uh, it had Best Buy been open or the Guitar Center. Uh, <laughs> so I'm trying to order equipment, uh, you know, from Amazon. Yep. You know, and if I, you know, I'm sitting here in my studio uh, uh, in the basement you know, which is a microphone and, and an interface. Somebody, I didn't even know what an interface was. I barely do too, by the way. I'm using my laptop. So yeah, I, I get you. I'm not a technical person at all. It is it is not an easy thing to do. And so anyway, but we were able to get it done and, uh, and finally figure out, uh, you know, the pieces that I needed. And then I, I wanted to do something college basketball centric. So we've had uh, Mark Few and Tom Izzo and some of the, the Frank Martin, Mick Cronin, Yep. Uh, we've had a lot of the coaches you've just named on, uh, Brad Underwood, but we've also had uh, Kevin Frazier from Entertainment Tonight, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Dockich, Jay Billis, um, uh, Doug Gottlieb, uh, all the way to the former president of the Hells Angels. Wow. Uh, and so uh, I used to fight for money at their clubhouse. Um, and he remembered we'd stayed in touch all these years. And so uh, it was, it's just something I've had a lot of fun with. And it's, it's just, I, I get into more of the story off the court or about leadership or about life and about their personal stories way more than it's, we don't get into X's and O's uh, that much. And we really don't get into, okay, you got this game coming up next week. Um, it's more about right. their program and their journeys. Had a lot of fun with it though. 
Well, you know, you'll always have a lasting influence because every time I watch a game and I see a loose ball on the floor, I yell out, come on, be a Bronco, get on the floor. Yeah. Because I know that's what you yelled at my boy and everybody else. And I remember after he played his last game for you and still was at Western, I think he had a PE class. It might have been badminton or something. And he put on his one of his social media as well. I just dove on the floor in badminton. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, that's that's yeah. what Talk would have wanted you to do. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so it's so you know, I just wanted toughness and Drake Drake exemplified toughness. Um, but it was something that the kids heard every year. Like, look, you know, I don't care if you're eating uh, dinner or, or breakfast. If somebody rolls a ball across your living room floor, <laughs> you better freaking dive. OK, on that loose ball. I, I don't if there's a loose ball on the asphalt, I want you to dive. You know, it's uh, you know, so, yes, we talk, it's good to hear. Um, the, it's the, lasted. I promise you. It's lasted to me. Not that I play, but if I see it, I swear to God, Hawk, I see it and I go, get on that floor. Uh, yeah. And I, I expect guys now, if guys don't do it, I'm disappointed. Like, what are you it's, doing? It, 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 you know, I see too many guys bend over at the knees. And in all yep. honesty, I'm, I'm being serious about this. Um, that's when you get torn ACLs. When mm -hmm. other people are diving at your feet and you're bending over, you know, and not diving. Now, you may pick up a broken nose, but as I tell the guys, all the time, I had Jerry West, the logo, he had seven of them. You know, right. uh, you haven't really, Al McGuire, the late Al McGuire, great coach at Marquette all those years. He had a saying, he said uh, one time, you haven't played basketball until you've broken your nose. You've just experienced it. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and so broken nose, and we have masks for those things now. But when you lose a ball game because of a lack of effort or a lack of hustle, that, that, that loss sticks with you forever. You know, so, yeah. so get on the floor. Good for you. Well, Hawk, I can't tell you how great it's been to catch up with you. And I'm certainly on behalf of my wife and my son and I, we can't thank you and your staff, uh, Coach Bates, Coach Farmer, who I'd love to get on one of these days too. Uh, one of the great people I've ever met in my life uh, for everything that happened in Kalamazoo over the years. And certainly my best to you and to Kelly and your family. And uh, thank you again for being here today, taking some time on your spring break. I greatly appreciate it. And make sure, uh, make sure you pass on to your wife. I just talked to Drake last week. Uh, about her new position, yes, in the in the, in the with the overlooking swimming, you mm -hmm. know, that, that tremendous and and uh, always great to hear your voice uh, when you come on air as well. So I really appreciate you having me on, Dave. My best to you always. Yeah, thank you, Hawk, very much. Steve Hawkins, former coach of Western Michigan, host of the Next Possession podcast, and ESPN analyst, joining me on my nooner. That'll do it. Uh, maybe Justin Rose's blood <laughs> could be one under par now. I'm going to check that out as soon as I finish here. But for Hawk and for all of you, thank you for watching. I'll post this on YouTube uh, as well as soon as I try to figure out how to do it. Take <laughs> yeah. care, everybody.